Welcome back to Sikistan and today we're dealing with some of those questions and comments we you put in that video that we asked you to do and now we're dealing with a little kind of narky tete a tete with someone um, so we're we're going no we were never going to be cunts about this but I think it's a good opportunity to talk about something <laughs> now we are now we're going to be cunts about it uh, so Daniel Kenny came in with a little narky little um, reject kinesphobic narratives about behind the neck pressing accept and share kinesphobic narratives about squatting with no back flexion the Sikhistan doctrine is complex indeed uh, kinesphobia firstly for everyone who doesn't know uh, is a rational fear of movement which I don't think we have uh, which so this which just strange. to give you a bit of context on this was in one of our other videos the person talked about how their professor had never told them press behind the neck which of course is a thing we've heard for years from random different places and of course we said that's ridiculous why would you never press behind the neck Daniel is conflating two different things though unfortunately yeah so there's a number of aspects here right so pressing behind the neck is is certainly something people with normal shoulder position should be able to do uh, normal ranges of motion in the shoulder if you did any sort of range of motion test you should be able to do a press behind the neck with roughly just outside shoulder width grip and you should be able to do it with some sort of load on there uh, when you look at the range of motion the shoulder goes through so you obviously externally rotate our shoulders to get there we usually have a slight amount of extension but for most people that extension will just bring them to neutral in the upper back you may have some abduction of the shoulders as you press and go away from yourself and adduction as you bring the bar back down but there's certainly nothing outside of normal kind of realms of healthy shoulders for pressing behind the neck the difference in the range of motion between a normal in front of the neck or front rack press and behind the neck are very very minimal uh, what you will see is people with poor upper back posture internally rotating into shoulders rounding forward with shoulders the t-spine and upper back they will have issues getting into that position uh, but it's certainly not a position where anything is is uh, anything is compromised so you have the use of the back in the back's correct neutral position you have the use of a ball and jocket so joint in both your shoulders uh, which will allow for a huge amount of internal and external rotation adduction and abduction of the shoulders and you basically get a very very safe range of motion with that shoulder and how that shoulder is going and there's certainly issues with bringing a barbell that's very heavily weighted down behind your neck uh, for example re-racking extremely heavy jerks onto the back can have some issues because you're bringing load down directly onto the cervical spine or the upper portions of the t-spine but in terms of the movement itself there and the joints that is being put through that range of motion uh, there's certainly no issues where there are issues and where uh, Danny is or Daniel is, is kind of mixed up here is that where in the shoulder we have a ball and socket joint we do not have ball and socket joints with our spine right so where in the spine we can rotate the spine we can move our spine around quite a lot we can uh, bend it forward move it back we can rotate as we're doing those forward and backward bends we don't have a system of musculature directly around the spine itself so we have a system of musculature that will control extension and flexion and then we have a, a complex system of musculature which will uh, control rotation of the spine but we do not have an enclosed capsule which will allow for this kind of medial atlas joint style of movement where uh, we can move everything around in a circle under load very very well so obviously we have simple stacking of discs and plates which will not uh, basically accept load in all positions very very well as everyone will know the classic thing of uh, the spine being in flexion or the spine being in extension and that kind of cartilaginous tissue being pushed out against the nerve and us getting this kind of nerve pain in our lower back everyone is is familiar with that experience and that's the difference between a joint such as the back where we have stacking of plates versus a ball and socket joint such as a shoulder right you have a sheer force coming in so you imagine if you have butt wink which is what you're talking about here when we rotate those hips at the bottom and we get that butt wink you're getting a level of flexion within the spine itself that level of flexion is because of a shear force so a shear force if i have these two pens here a shear force will be pushing these pens away from each other like that if you imagine if that instead of being two pens just stacked on top of each other was a ball within a socket 
that ball with an socket accepts sheer force an awful lot more uh, easily and with an awful lot more integrity than the spine will. So uh, you so certainly get subluxations and dislocations of the shoulder joint, but you get them for different reasons than where you get them of the spine, and particularly the lumbar spine, when you get uh, lower back flexion during a squat. The other reason we don't like to see back flexion or butt wink in the squat is it's almost always an indicator of poor performance in the actual squat or an issue elsewhere so you might quote me someone who can squat 320 kilos and they'll have a butt wink and we will absolutely agree with that person and say that is perfectly okay and that person should keep doing that if they can squat 320 kilos at that then that is no problem but everyone else is not that person this is like the back upper back flexion and then the deadlift so which you might also be talking about here for example what we want to see is the most optimal technique for everyone and we want to see people use a technique that allows them to squat the most weight but also squat that safely but performance is also highly attributed here so when we see butt wink or lower back flexion in the squat for example which is what we're probably very talking about in this video it's almost always an indicator of likely ankle mobility issues or hip mobility issues relative to that person so you might see discrepancy from side to side or they're not able to reach a range of motion that they are actually able to. So if we compare it between individuals, they may have different degrees of range of motion, but for this individual in question with the back flexion, if we're dealing with someone, their hip mobility may be limited to an area of that they can actually get to, but right now, for whatever reasons, they are limited to a certain degree by other issues. So that's usually an indicator for us why we don't like to see flexion, is because there's an issue somewhere else, if there's an issue somewhere else and then further down the line we're probably going to see an injury related to that or we're probably seeing poor performance so that's one reason we don't like to see it it's a kind of a, a canary in the coal mine being an issue now why we don't like to see it in the individual so in that moment in the back squat is because if you look at your back as a moment arm or a piece of equipment or a bar a lever doing work usually what happens is when we see lower back flexion we often see a forward tipping of the torso and like you talked about the most important thing we want to see in the back squat, regardless of high bar or low bar, is you want to see a constant back angle. So this ensures that we're loading our legs, which are the prime movers in the squat. If we see a forward or rearward shifting of our back in either direction in the, in the squat, front or back squat, we are shifting the load away from them and putting the load on our back, which is less able to handle loads. Because if you imagine this, so we have our moment arm, we have our lever. At one end is the bottom of our spine and the other end then is the barbell with the weighted load. The further rearward this barbell shifts forward the more load we're putting on the bottom of our spine to resist this forward tipping motion of the barbell so we have that gravity again toppling us forward which is what we want to resist and if we see this lower back flexion in the back squat and we see this pulling forward usually it's an indicator of inability to coordinate a person's lower and upper body in the back squat so they are either an indicator of something else being an issue or an indicator of very poor technique for the vast majority of people now the Intergroup differences are much more similar to the individual differences. So we might have outliers who can squat safely with lower back. But as coaches, we need to risk assess a person's movement. Now, there might be no longitudinal studies saying lower back flexion doesn't cause any more injuries than a uh, lower back flexion versus extension. But we can safely assume from visually looking at a lift and using our logical reasoning, the back and extension is much stronger than a back and flexion because it indicates better performance. And we see people with better back squat technique always have their back in extension much, 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 much more often than they do have their back in flexion. So we go, okay, how much risk is this person willing to take? If they're an average person who just enjoys training or if it's an athlete, we need to keep safe. Both scenarios there, we are putting ourselves in a position where we say, okay, we need to keep this person safer. The probability that this person will more likely hurt their back if their back is in flexion than extension is a pretty obvious answer to us. So we'll say we don't want to be putting this person in flexion. We want to keep this person most likely in extension because it's probably the safer thing. It's almost certainly the better back squat technique and it's likely an indicator that other things are working optimally. So Daniel, I appreciate your narky comment, but it is useful for other people to help educate people and let people know our opinion on this. Uh, I, I hate this shit. Yeah, so much because you see it so much from people like Squat University or other people. They come in with this narrative and they come in with this narkiness, and it, it there's no like maybe there's no like discourse for this. There's no level of you know adulthood. There's no level of someone being a grown up saying 
maybe I don't know if we should be afraid of flexion. And then we'd be like, yeah, probably not. But here's my opinion on this, which is what we did there. They come in with this fucking fortune shit with their yeah, yeah, comments. accept, reject. Yeah, and then talk about this. You know, this is the. Uh, uh, it's very childish, and it also just is. I think it's just kind of stupid, and it doesn't further any narrative. Also, I would say that the back is something that people really don't understand in the case where a back, like a neutral spine, where you have everything stacked down perfectly, you've no imbalances, a neutral spine will have lumbar extension. The amount of lumbar extension is slight, it certainly varies from person to person, but a natural lumbar curve is extension in the spine. So when somebody is standing there fully natural, same way where if you go into a uh, kinesiology lab you will see a, a skeleton hanging there and there will be extension in the lumbar spine with that if you're seeing any amount of butt wink you have gone beyond that natural lumbar spine or natural lumbar curve you've then gone to neutral which is what some people are aiming for and then you've gone into a small bit of flexion at the bottom you've surpassed two degrees of kind of okayedness with your normal positions in the same way where if you got somebody and they were not able to bring the bar down behind their neck and they were starting to really extend their upper back to make contact with the barbell on their upper neck, you wouldn't have them pressing behind the neck. You wouldn't have somebody squatting if their back is rounding during the squat. And it's just dumb. Like it's. There's also an issue there as well. If we do have any kind of short term longitudinal studies on flexion versus extension, we're certainly not going to see people doing back squats with two and a half times body weight, two times body weight across the period of weeks. The fact that you could get a power number adequate, a number of samples that would match your power number that could squat two and a half times body weight, just is incredibly unlikely to happen. Usually what we'll see is these with body weight or like smaller levels of flexion or like a couple of pounds, people who are untrained. So obviously your body can move in a particular range of motion. Uh, if you, for example, are in a particular grappling position or you're picking up a ball in a rock, you can do those unweighted very, very safely and there's no issue there. And obviously, we've never said there's an issue there with them being no. flexion. But if you're under huge amounts of load and under repetitions under load, you just don't want to see that flexion for no. the reasons we've mentioned. It just doesn't make sense. And I, I don't get why people are arguing for that flexion. What's, what's it's the just best laziness. What's, it's no, it's contrarianism. I, no, no, no. I think it's contrarianism. I think, do you think? I think it's contrarianism. I, I think it's a thing of being like, Oh, it doesn't matter if I'm twenty five percent body fat because I I get my performance, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's what I think. That's where I think it comes from of the nature of mm-hmm. I don't have to fix it because my favorite powerlifter does it. Yeah. Uh, so, sometimes butt wink is, is mistaken then with a large amount of so some of these lifters are larger, uh, some of them are, have higher percentages of body fat, and oftentimes he got them fat. No, 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 just higher percentage of body fat and usually when they squat, sometimes we'll see a shifting of their ass basically, and there'll be yeah. a lot of fucking adipose tissue from their ass to the lower back and it looked like an extreme degrees of, of flexion in the lower back but actually it's just that fat moving a little yeah, bit. so yeah. there is probably some flexion in the lower back because they're not able to sit in between their hips but in most scenarios it might not be as extreme as much as possible and rarely should you use that a uh, anecdotal evidence of individual lifters uh, i think you should never use it and as we talk about that a lot for yeah. sure it's not a great way of making arguments um so there we go pew 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 pew